Good morning. I'd like to get started. Uh, I'd like to call a committee on health and human services um, to order. Uh, it's, February, it's Thursday, February 15th, 2024, and uh, we have a, one presentation today and two bills on the agenda. And there is a quorum present. Um, first, before we get started with the presentation, I just wanted to take a minute to introduce, uh, we have new pages this session and uh, wondered if they could come out and um, introduce themselves. Um, they play a really important role in having our committee uh, run smoothly and so I just wanted to give them an opportunity to, to, to say hi and, and introduce themselves. Well, thank you. Um, really appreciate your, your work during the, the session. And then I just wanted to take a minute to have Senate Council, if they could um, introduce themselves and say a little bit about how, um, at a high level, kind of how they're dividing their work. Um, Ms. Hoffman Litchie was here with us last year, but uh, Mr. Hodella wasn't, and so wanted to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair, committee members. Uh, I'm Allie Hoffman Litchie with Senate Council. My areas are related to child care, economic assistance, homelessness, mental health, and kind of every area that surrounds those. Um, probably the big ones will be children and families, child protection. Um, there's a lot, but those are the big ones. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I am Nolan Hudala, also nonpartisan counsel for this committee. I do everything else. Um, <laughs> but uh, to sum it up, it would be the most of the subject matter within the Department of Health, so licensing boards, uh, regulation over HMOs, and then also just any uh, health care reform in general, health insurance, uh, MA, Minnesota Care, um, and uh, any other kind of health insurance topics that touch those areas. Thanks. Thank you. And we had um, Lexi, or Ms. Stengel was with our committee last year, and, and she is now um, taking on different responsibilities, so she won't, won't be part of our committee. So thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, we do have first on our agenda a presentation, um, a presentation on the Academic Health Task Force. Um, very pleased that um, former Commissioner Malcolm can be here. She chaired the, the task force, and uh, we had a very um, lively and interesting time starting back in October. So, October, yes. So um, I wanted to have her come and kind of go through uh, what was what was done in the task force. Um, I was fortunate to be on the task force as a legislative member along with uh, Chair Liebling from the House. Um, and there are, um, there is a, a very lengthy report that um, hopefully you'll have a chance to look through and, and look over that. Um, and then there are many recommendations that uh, we, some of which are um, pointed at the legislature to take action on. So we will be talking about that also this session. So please uh, welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself and, and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Good morning, I'm Jan Malcolm. I had the privilege of serving as the chair of the Governor's Task Force on Academic Health at the University of Minnesota. It's uh, very, very nice to be with you this morning on what is finally looks like a winter morning in Minnesota. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Wickland, for uh, the invitation today. I think you have uh, copies of these uh, slides before you. The body of the report itself is, is pretty accessible, I hope, um, about 25 pages, but very lengthy appendices with a lot more um, data and detail in them. Um, I want to uh, talk mostly about the recommendations. I'm not going to go through every one of the 20, but kind of group them a little bit more thematically. But uh, very briefly, want to take you through some of the kind of some of the background and some of the context that really shaped the content of the recommendations. Um, the task force itself was created by uh, an executive order from Governor Walls, and the, the intent was really to focus on the health sciences programs uh, that, that constitute what's known as academic health, specifically at the University of Minnesota, 
but not in isolation. Um, and this important to stress that this was really a, about, uh, primarily about the mission at the University of Minnesota to train the health professionals that serve Minnesotans. The U is not the only uh, trainer of, of most of these professions. Some, uh, it is the only professional school uh, for, uh, for instance, dentistry and pharmacy, but um, certainly trains the bulk of physicians, nurses, public health practitioners, pharmacists, dentists, veterinarians. Um, and in fact, that's one, one of the unique things about the U is the comprehensiveness of the schools that, that train the, 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 uh, the breadth of health professionals. Um, but the, the, the executive order asked us to really look um, primarily at the training function, but to do that with an eye to some of the public health goals that, and the public policy goals that we have for Minnesota, where we know we, we really have um, you know, significant concerns about accessibility, particularly of primary care, particularly in rural Minnesota and in some underserved communities. Um, of course, our, our shared commitment to health outcome improvement for everyone with an eye to health equity. And uh, uh, knowing, of course, that uh, ac accessible, affordable uh, care remains uh, always a challenge in our state and every other. So the task force really was set up to, to look at academic health, but in a broader context. The second slide um, it just shows you who the members of the task force were, 15 member task force, which is the limit under an executive order. Um, and you can see uh, uh, both the, the legislative representation, as, as Chair Wickland has mentioned, uh, the Office of Higher Ed and the Department of Health were specifically named in the executive order. The University of Minnesota had two appointees, uh, the Dean of the Medical School and uh, one of the regents, Dr. Penny Wheeler. And then the, the bulk of the, the, of the members were appointed, not necessarily because of their expertise in academic health, but because of the, their expertise in specific areas that really relate to the outcomes that we're looking for uh, from, uh, from uh, the academic health enterprise, if you will. We also, uh, and you can see there their, uh, their names and their affiliations, um, we were also really fortunate to have um, uh, former governors um, Palenti and Dayton both um, actively participate on the task force as special advisors. They were not members, they were not voting members, but were very, very, both of them actively engaged um, and, and brought uh, to the task force the experiences that they had had when they were governors um, working with the University of Minnesota and their, their kind of statewide vision for the importance of academic health. The, um, uh, the, the next slide uh, talks about some, just some important things to clarify about the context. Um, the, obviously, this happened at a time when the university and Fairview were um, in discussions about their partnership, whether it would continue and in what form it would continue. Um, the, the details of that partnership, and even, in fact, whether the partnership should continue, was not something the task force was asked to weigh in on. We are, we, we are not experts, most of us, in, um, in the, uh, the, the, the fine points of, a, of the administration of a partnership such as this. Um, and, and really, the governor's uh, point of view all along was that this is, a, this is a, a business relationship that those parties need to work out. Our task was to understand what are sort of the public policy questions and public interests um, that, that we might uh, have some, uh, some perspective on, but we were not uh, there to say what should happen to that partnership or how should it be restructured. We did, however, from the first day that we met, uh, appreciate that 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 set an incredibly important context for all of these discussions and that it was going to be difficult um, for the task force and then for the policymakers, you and the governor, to really know what to do with these recommendations without more clarity about that uh, relationship. So one of the, one of the things we, uh, we came out with in the report as a really our, our top recommendation really was that, that it is critical for the, for the state that that uh, partnership get resolved as quickly as possible. And certainly um, both the university and Fairview folks heard that loud and clear from the task force um, and I think um, redoubled their efforts to, uh, to move that conversation forward uh, perhaps a little more quickly than it was on track to do. And we're glad to see uh, just a, a week or, or so ago 
that they have announced a framework for that, uh, for that relationship going forward. That's a very good development, we think, um, and is, is going to be important uh, that they continue to work on the details of that framework so that we can add more detail to these recommendations and you all can understand what that was going to mean to the, uh, the, the, the questions of the debate, the dialogue around uh, public support for academic health. Um, the uh, task force charge, as I already mentioned, certainly included but was not just focused only on the medical school. As important and as complicated as the medical school is, the task force charge was explicitly to look more broadly at all of the health sciences schools. And to do that with an eye to what's going on in the larger healthcare system and, and public health system, the health ecosystem as we began to call it, um, which we know is under considerable stress. We certainly have the workforce crisis that exists across the entire health continuum, whether that's home and community-based services, acute care, and long-term care, um, and that all of that is, is related. We've heard certainly about the financial uh, distress in acute care and long-term care in particular. Um, and we've heard about just the, the capacity limits of, this, of the system, including in public health. So we, we wanted to be just really aware of, of kind of that bigger context that the U does not exist in a vacuum. Obviously, it, it exists as part of and to serve that broader ecosystem. We also know that the, the system itself, as you have struggled with for many years as well, um, has some pretty challenging um, gaps and in the in the continuum of care. Uh, prevent, uh, the, the incentives in the healthcare system are pretty widely acknowledged to be um, oriented, not necessarily optimally toward health outcomes, certainly not from a population point of view. So we're kind of having to have this conversation in the context of a, of a macro healthcare system that's got a lot of challenges. And that a lot of the conversation became around how can the, what is the university's role and how can the university play a larger role in helping to address some of those macro challenges. Uh, the next slide, um, just wanted to outline for you quickly some of the, the key things that we learned as we kind of did a deep dive into how is academic health structured? How is it paid for across the country? Um, and, and even as I mentioned, we were uh, directed to focus primarily on the training part of what's referred to as the tripartite mission of academic health, which is training, research, and then actual care delivery. Um, even though our focus was really intended to be primarily training, we quickly um, came to appreciate that that is just completely inseparable from the research and care missions of academic health, in part because of this next point. The funding, the way that medical schools in particular, the, by far the largest economic component of the health sciences, um, the way that that funding for medical schools happens has changed remarkably during the last 40 or 50 years. Um, to the point where, whereas there used to be more direct funding at, fate, at state and federal uh, and private levels for education specifically, now that is a real minority of the funding and the great majority of funding for the, for the academic health enterprise comes from clinical care, comes from the revenues and, and the margins that are produced by delivering care to people. So that, that that is part of what makes the training function inseparable from the care delivery function in particular. Um, it, we also have ha came to appreciate that the way that the funding happens, the funds flow as it's sometimes referred to within academic health is extraordinarily complicated. And it's different from state to state, making head-to-head -head comparisons of what is one state doing versus another state really difficult um, to, to get at. We did um, one of the, the executive order um, tasks was to look at other models to see if there were some, some lessons uh, to be learned from Minnesota. And what became very clear uh, in our literature review and our consultation with a couple of experts in the field was that there is no one best model. There's no one right answer for how should an academic health enterprise be structured. There are examples around the country where a, a university, for instance, clearly owns and, and or controls through governance uh, a health system to, to deliver the, the care. 
uh, that are very successful and models where the university owns facilities that are not successful. And the reverse is also true. There are successful models where the university does not own its facilities and uh, models where, and that, and that works, and models where the university does not own its facilities and that's a problem. So it's, it really depends much, much more on the local market conditions and the specifics of the relationships between a, a university and its community partners. So certainly there are lessons to be learned about what are some of the ingredients for success, which have a lot to do with alignment of goals and accountabilities across all three of the legs of that stool, the training, the research, and the care. But there isn't a perfect model that we could just uh, look to and emulate in Minnesota, and that was, that was an important um, thing for the task force to understand. So we certainly appreciated from the get-go that, that really you can't, you, you can't take academic health out of the context of the overall healthcare system challenges and, and fix it, in quotes, um, without dealing with some of those pressures uh, and those discontinuities of the way that financing and care delivery is done in the system as a whole. Another key thing that we, uh, that we really came to appreciate was um, care is changing already. Care models are changing. The impact that technology is going to have on the way care is delivered in the future is going to be very, very different with very big implications for what kind of professionals we'll need uh, and where and how they relate to each other. So the uh, point being, we can't just lock in a status quo system because that is not the system that we're, we're going to need as care continues to evolve. We need a dynamic model that is able to, uh, to adjust to what, what we expect to be very, very different um, care models in the future. Um, some, some of our, so that was all just important context for us. We spent a lot of time trying to understand what really are the, you know, what are the levers, what are the problems we're really trying to address, um, and, and how, do we, how do we kind of do both, you know, support the very important uh, missions of academic health in the today, and set up a, a system for the future that's going to be able to evolve as our needs evolve. So some of the th sort of the thematic conclusions I just want to pull out before going into the specific recommendations. On the next slide, um, I already mentioned that one of the really unique assets that we have is the comprehensiveness of the health sciences programs at the university. Um, and, and certainly not only the health sciences programs, but other capacities at the U, the schools of design, engineering, law, business. Uh, that we've got a lot of assets at the University of Minnesota that we think can be leveraged um, better and coordinated more closely to help really uh, in create uh, and support this, the, the new models of care that we need in the future. We also, outside the university, and, and I would say the university has a, a lot to do with having created the, the broader ecosystem that we enjoy in Minnesota, we have an unusual breadth and depth of clinical capacity in Minnesota. Very strong health systems with a lot of capacity for highly specialized care and research and, uh, and, and engaging uh, also in, uh, in training and support of the workforce. It's just an unusually rich um, set of healthcare assets that we have here, which is a good thing. Um, but the task force kind of observed that um, that's important, and we should figure out how do we leverage what exists in the community as well as within the university uh, to, to fulfill these, these missions. Um, and so we, we really, at the, at the bottom, we kind of called it our, you know, sort of our, the healthy tension that we faced um, to, to be responsive to the university's needs here and now while also uh, wanting to make sure that we are investing in, the, in the, the capability of the future within the U and in the broader community to meet some of these challenges. The, the university itself um, has, for about a year, been really working to articulate its own vision for the academic health system of the future. And, and this is me sort of paraphrasing what we heard. Uh, and when there was just a lot of really good dialogue, a ton of really helpful information that the university presented to the task force, much of which is, if not in the appendices of the report, all on the task force webpage at the health department. Um, but the, the vision that the U has articulated is, uh, is to build a, a, a much more robust academic health enterprise than, than even what we have today, which, which has a lot of capability, um, to build on our strengths. 
to, to grow the capacity for all three parts of the stool uh, of the mission, to, to grow capacity for training. We, we need more uh, people in the workforce, doctors, nurses, public health folks, pharmacists, dentists. So we need to grow the capacity to train more folks and to retain more folks here in Minnesota, to continue to grow the research function, which is a huge uh, part of how you recruit the faculty and recruit the students. And certainly we know, he, especially here in Minnesota, the huge economic um, impact that it, that it has to, uh, to have a robust um, um, medical uh, and public health research capability and care um, to continue to improve in the rankings of, of each of these schools. And I, one of the things we should all be proud of is all six schools are fully accredited and all of them rank in the top 10 or very close to it nationally or even internationally. So we've really got some great capability to, to build on here. But it's important not to sit on your laurels. There have been some really important gains uh, both in rankings and other measures of quality, uh, but that, that is not something that happens without continued attention and investment. The U really sees that it is in a position to play a, a larger leadership role in meeting the state's public health needs. Um, we have heard from the U and a feature of their framework agreement uh, with Fairview is that they believe it's very, very important for them to reacquire the, the facilities that in which they deliver care uh, from Fairview so that those are under uni university ownership and control. Um, and so that is part of their vision. And an important part of the vision is to um, be, develop, develop the capability to, to do the kind of investments that are needed that haven't been happening in recent years in facility improvements in their uh, in their care delivery facilities. Um, it, so immediate facility improvements that are needed to add capacity uh, to meet unmet needs as well as eventual uh, replacement of some facilities. So those are all parts of the university's vision. And on the next slide, the university then made three specific recommendations to the task force, which are included in the task force report. The first of their recommendations was to create a fund for facilities improvements um, and to create that fund in 2024 uh, and to begin to populate the fund with funds, although there, uh, there's discussion to be had about what is the source of those funds, what's the mix of philanthropy, university investment, and, uh, and proposed public investment in the facilities improvement funds, but to, to, to get going on that in 2024. And at the same time, to do a comprehensive needs assessment uh, of what's going to be needed, bigger picture and longer term, for all of the facilities. And to do that needs assessment um, in, in 2024. Um, a, a second recommendation is to begin planning now for the new facilities that the U is convinced that it will need, specifically a replacement hospital. Even though there's not uh, public money being requested for that, in 2024, um, the recommendation is that th those things take a long time to develop and to, to, to start doing the planning for that new facility now. The third university recommendation was for an, uh, an, an increased um, annual direct appropriation of $80 million per year for specific programmatic purposes. And you can see them uh, detailed here in the bullets. Uh, several knew what they referred to as medical discovery teams, which are sort of issue-based um, groups um, uh, that would be interdisciplinary in this case. Um, a proposal to uh, invest in more access for, uh, to care in underserved communities, specifically at, at Cook, the Community University Healthcare Center, uh, some mobile programming with Hennepin County. Um, uh, another proposal uh, to uh, to what they refer to as primary care transformation to beef up their capability to do consultation to primary care providers around the state, a uh, number of workforce development initiatives, um, uh, new care model design and investment in uh, something called the Center for Learning Health Systems, which already exists between the School of Public Health and the medical school, and a, 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 a fund to support innovation opportunities um, uh, in rural health and pre-hospital care. So some specific things that the university came forth with as a proposal in response to some of what the, the task force um, said were priorities about 
rural health care, access, primary care, equity, underserved populations. So these are the, th the, th the three recommendations that the university brought to the task force. They are included in our report. Um, the, next, uh, the next slide. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the 20 recommendations that are in the task force, but kind of group them and, and talk about some of the highlights. They're all in the report. So our, the, the, tax, the, the tack that we took was to say, we're going to include every recommendation that a task force member makes in the report. We're not going to vote yes or no. Do we include this? Do we not? We're not going to say both things have to have 60% support to be in the report. Um, what we did instead was to include everything, but then really m measure, if you will, the, the degrees of support for the idea. Um, and for folks who didn't completely support it or who supported it or said, I would support this if X, Y, Z, we captured all that detail of what suggestions task force members had to, um, to improve upon a recommendation that would that would, in their view, uh, lend it to more support. So what you see in the body of the report are recommendations kind of grouped by topic area, kind of ranked in that category in descending order of, of how much support that recommendation had. And in one of the appendices, there are multiple ways of organizing the recommendations so you can see kind of degrees of support and a lot of detailed comments about what were the what were the questions about that recommendation. But we, we thought that there might be value uh, for the governor and the legislature to see kind of the full range of ideas and to see what some of the dialogue about them had been. So the, 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 uh, the categories then, uh, several, uh, 10 about, I think, related to the university itself, including the three that I just walked through with you. Um, again, we did, not, uh, we did not take yes or no votes on these. Um, but I would say that when it came to the, the university's vision and the three specific recommendations, clearly the task force um, generally supported the U's vision to continue to, to build on its strengths, uh, become a, a larger resource for the state. And generally we supported the three recommendations with some important um, uh, points added to that support. Uh, the majority of the task force members felt that um, each of the three recommendations uh, could, could benefit from some additional detail, certainly, and, and they would obviously that would happen through any legislative process. We have some specific recommendations for the kinds of questions that the U should be prepared to, uh, to answer in, in forwarding its proposals about uh, some of the financials underlying the request, some of the outcome measures that would be um, uh, intended to be achieved, et cetera. Um, but I, do, I just do want to be clear that the task force felt like these are all meritorious ideas. They need more work. Um, uh, but not everybody f felt that way. Uh, there, was, there was a division of, of opinion among task force members, some thinking, um, you know, this, the, the case has already been sufficiently made and uh, we need to move and move faster. And so some of the things the task force uh, suggested about doing needs assessments first and, you know, having some more conditions on some of the, of the funding uh, was not universally agreed by task force members. So that folks were, there was a group of folks who thought we just need to move and move fast and maybe even do more. Uh, financially, and and another group that that thought there were a series of important questions to be addressed as that uh, as that dialogue continues. Um, I, I just uh, uh, my understanding is that the the regents of the university have now approved the three recommendations um, to move forward through the university's processes and to the legislature, and that was one of the things that the task force. Um, needed to see was that that, that had been through the university's, um, all the university's processes. In addition to those three uh, proposals from the university, uh, some of the, 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 the recommendations that were really important to the task force, um, the second one here was to develop a shared strategic plan across those six professional schools. It doesn't exist today. They're, they collaborate a lot, but that they do that sort of on an ad hoc basis. There aren't shared goals, shared resources, shared measures of success across the six, and we think that that would be an essential platform, if you will, um, to sort of guide the university's vision in the future and to guide their funding requests as they come forward to the governor and the legislature. 
Uh, another recommendation is to um, conduct a, a comprehensive statewide needs assessment for facilities and infrastructure supporting the, the health of Minnesotans that um, that would include but not be limited to the University Medical Center. We think it's a, a, an appropriate time to take a, a broad look statewide at healthcare capacity, uh, how it's distributed, where some, uh, some needs exist um, that, are, that aren't currently uh, being, being met, uh, where might there be opportunity for more, um, more shared services, more collaboration. There's another recommendation related to that. Um, and the, the final recommendation uh, here uh, at least that I'm going to talk about this morning, was to suggest that it would be beneficial f if the legislature had more kind of um, comprehensive or unified line of sight to all university appropriations. Um, that the, the funding, the bulk of the funding, almost all the funding goes through uh, the uh, Higher Education Committee. Certainly, you know, a lot of, of state money goes to the university through the medical assistance program that comes through Health and Human Services, but there's not really a unified uh, kind of a, a, a total view of, of, the, uh, of the investments in the university and how those are being allocated within the university. So that was a, a suggestion um, that perhaps there, there could be more, uh, more synergy or more collaboration between legislative committees to get that more comprehensive picture. The second group of recommendations had to do um, not just with the university, but with uh, workforce planning and development. Um, the first suggestion is that the legislature uh, request and, and, and then fund development of a truly comprehensive statewide health professions workforce plan. We don't have one today. We have pieces of workforce planning, but there isn't really a comprehensive uh, health workforce plan for the state. Um, particularly not one that, that is forward-looking and tries to anticipate both demographic changes and other changes in healthcare delivery that will, that will change what we need and where we need it. Um, second and somewhat related is uh, to establish a coordinating entity to guide um, uh, future workforce investments in, in a more dynamic and ongoing way, including making better use of and coordination of the multiple workforce data, uh, data sources that exist. And the higher ed and MDH both confirmed there, it, there is no such coordination right now. So some of these things that were like studies or analyses that may, may seem not, act, not very action oriented, um, we still think are very important kind of analytic and planning tools for the state that it sort of surprised us to know that didn't exist. Um, and we just think that there's a, going to be a, a, a real need for a, a much more kind of um, tightly organized and cohesive set of data and set of recommendations that will, you know, can, this is not a one-time shot, obviously. This is going to be an ongoing important need for the state. And we do know that there are programs today that are in place, that are effective, that could be scaled up um, to increase, um, uh, for instance, pathway programs, financial supports, incentives for uh, uh, retention, uh, recruitment and retention, particularly in certain practice types. Um, the, the next category is uh, collaboration and coordination across healthcare systems. Um, two recommendations here. One is specific to the really the, the public institutions that have the largest role in training and, and research uh, and to look at um, whether there could be closer collaboration between those entities. Um, and then the second recommendation kind of takes another step further to the point that I made earlier about just the extraordinary capability that exists in Minnesota. What kind of um, closer collaboration might exist across some of our major health systems, <clears throat> including Mayo, when it comes to highly specialized care um, uh, research and teaching? Um, not, not, e not necessarily an easy thing to do in our competitive market, but to begin to explore what are you know, potentially some incentives um, that the state might be able to bring to bear to um, encourage um, and incentivize more collaboration than we, than we see today. And finally, a couple of recommendations to um, increase funding, both 
net increase the amount of funding, but also to broaden the funding sources to support academic health. Back to that point I made earlier about the fact that um, health professions education is, is heavily dependent on clinical profits today, and that, create, that just sets up a conflict of incentives about what kind of care um, is needed in order to produce the subsidies to produce the, uh, the training. So um, recommendations here to make sure that we're uh, doing everything we can to maximize Medicaid funding, um, including um, increasing reimbursement rates, um, making sure that we're drawing down all eligible federal funding and making the most uh, appropriate use of intergovernmental transfers. We, we have understood that some states are having more success uh, than others in that, and we know that uh, from our colleagues at the Department of Human Services that CMS isn't necessarily um, enthusiastic about these types of tools, but uh, it, it bears looking at to make sure that we're not leaving anything on the table. Um, and then the, the final point, um, again, is to, is to sort of note that it, it's probably not a good model to expect any one health system partner to bear all of the cost burden of creating the, the, the clinical revenues that fund health professions training that the whole state depends upon. Um, so what other financing mechanisms um, might be appropriate to broaden that funding base? Um, and again, these are they're not all, all, I haven't mentioned all 20 of the recommendations, um, but uh, I wanted to call out some of the ones that seem to, to be, to the task force members, to be the highest leverage. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair or members. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate your going through it in that way. Um, wondering if members have any questions about the report or, or recommendations or anything about the, the task force. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, I mean, it's a lot to digest. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll all have a lot of questions, but I, I primarily just want to thank you, um, Commissioner, Chair, Malcolm, <laughs> uh, for your public service to our state. I feel, and Chair, Chair Wickland, too, who also was a member of the task force. It, this feels like an opportunity moment for Minnesota, and I really appreciate how the task force seemed to approach it that way. I just... The money shot to me here is the, the line, academic health cannot be fixed to meet the state's public health goals without broader changes in our national health care financing and delivery system. I think that is the one that we all need to be thinking about as we, we in the legislature right now kind of tinker around the edges. We do need national reform. There's a lot of money in health care right now, and most of it is um, concentrated in pharmaceuticals and in health insurance. Um, and I think that we, we need big picture takes, and, and I appreciate the task force approaching it in that way. So primarily just a thank you, and I, I think this is an opportunity for our state. Thank you. Um, any other members' you know, comments or questions? Senator Abler. I just trying to let somebody else go first, because actually I actually have um, quite a few questions and comments about this, but I appreciate the effort that's there. Um, and I... Um, it's, you know, somehow uh, we're trying to recreate, and I appreciate that. And I think that you could be, and I'll use, I'll say could, be a leader in health care and public health care, in innovation and collaboration. Um, and, and then there's the nuts and bolts of it operating, the health care thing, with the whole Fairview, and that was... That was a mess. As you know, maybe you were smart to stay out of it, but at the end, it has to be sorted out. And it's amazing to me where you're exchanging hundreds of millions of dollars back and forth, and some accounting rubric I do not understand, and that's insufficient. And then Fairview is kind of losing money, and it's it is remarkable some of the big money dollars uh, that that cross paths there. So, um, and I, I mean, I have. 20 questions, and I clearly there's not time for that today, but I, I think what I'm, everything is like, oh, give us money, we're going to fix it. That's kind of what I was, I was circling through. You give us the money to grow capacity, play a larger role, reacquire, invest, and then the three things for $80 million a year, which we don't have anymore. Um, and I think that if we're going to decide that the U is going to be 
truly the North Star of healthcare in Minnesota. I think they ought to be. And I think that the regents uh, and we all should agree that that's what we want them to be. And if they align their functions and their activities toward that, they could be that. Um, one of the recommendations, so that's meant to be encouraging, and I think there's no better institution to uh, guide that, and actually, frankly, no better chair to have conducted this, this uh, review than you. Uh, should I call you commissioner? Or <laughs> Ms. Malcolm, or whatever. Um, but so, like, for instance, uh, on page 11, uh, uh, development of a comprehensive statewide health professions workforce plan. If you just give us some money, we can do that. The you should just do it. They have uh, so many resources at their disposal. They have donors that would get, like, nothing better than to help with some of this. Um, they have, there's an army of people, uh, men, women, professions of every sort that have trained at the U, that admire the U. Uh, Governor Carlson, at his time, there, I don't know, there's probably pushing three quarters of a million graduates of the U or something. It was 400,000 back in his day um, that would love to be a part uh, for free, pay their expenses, buy them lunch, you know, give them free parking. And they would come, there are plenty of retirees who have spent a career in this industry and seen what goes on. Uh, I have a number of friends who are retired healthcare people, physicians and others, and they frankly would like something to do that would, sur that would survive time that they could be a part of. They've seen it all, they've lived through it, they've, they've endured They've enjoyed the U, what it gave them, they want to give something back. And so um, I, I think that I, I would welcome the U embracing that opportunity. Uh, as you suggest, there is little collaboration, there is little planning, there is little guidance. Um, and I think the U could be that. We spend a great deal of time electing 12 regents to go there, and mostly it works out pretty well. There's sometimes close votes, but. Um, a lot of times, I think there's quite a good pool of people in, in that role. Um, but I think it's a matter of them deciding that's the role they want to take. And if we simply um, just do the three things they want, where we give them $80 million a year, which we do not have, by the way. I think there was some pretty imprudent spending that went on. That I, Something should have been left aside for this, because we knew it was coming in the planning. I had no control over the budget. Um, but I think that... You know, um, why do we need to own a hospital? I mean, do we really need to own the, the Fairview Hospital? Is that really that important, and who's going to pay for that? I was reading the task force's sketch, or not the task force, the agreement, that they're going to pay for half of it and put half an escrow. Well, it, it's... So you should take on leadership and come up with a plan about how they're going to become the leader in the state, looking at everything and provide guidance. Um, in whatever clinical entities that they um, teach, and in public health as well. As, but then, if you're going to be a public health leader, you have to talk to the counties, and not just the Department of Health, about how they're going to do it, and, and where do they see the needs. And, and so there, there could be some thoughtful, you know, comprehensive planning going on, which I think would be amazing. And so, um, for the advices you're offering here, it's... Um, the people that don't have to find the money saying go spend a bunch of money. Um, I think in the practical world where we are now facing a deficit coming up, if we spend $80 million, we're even at the end of the next biennium with structural deficits to come. And so I think that you could help lead us out of these structural deficits by helping us focus our health care dollars better. How, how good is our Medicaid spending getting us the outcomes that we want? We spend multiple billions of dollars on health care to treat the effects of bad choices that people make and environmental and toxicities and all that stuff that, that often could be prevented um, by, you know, so many, that's, that's not meant to be a pejorative to anybody, but there's so, so much of health care can be prevention, which is mentioned in the report. So I, I think I want to encourage them about that, and I personally don't know that I would vote to give a dollar more to anything without a comprehensive plan from somebody, from some entity as, a, as bright as the you. So all the things you talk about, if you go like, it, it, you get the plan and then put the things together. Don't do more piecemeal, for heaven's sakes. 
And you, you hope that the health plans and the uh, providers, the big Alina and Sencha are going to like work together. Well, they're kind of competitors, <laughs> you know, and they're trying to survive and, and make some money for their investors and some are nonprofits. Um, but I think in a comprehensive idea, I think we would trust the U to provide that. I think it would be apolitical, and I think it could become the truly most amazing thing in the country. And I think, as you provoked my thinking, and Commissioner, as you have uh, led a really able group of people, um, I think that's a direction that could be really inspiring and could really make a difference. Otherwise, we're just going to be you know, chasing the dollars, and by the way, the feds are 34 trillion in debt, and so at some point they're going to start noticing that too, and say, no, we're not going to use some of these ways to get the money. So, I think if we really believe that we care about the individuals, both on that we help support in Minnesota Care Medicaid and all the waiver programs that we help to pay for, as well as the the, the health of our state, that that's somewhere that can go. And I would be excited to be a part of that, and I think. You'd probably find a thousand people across the state that'd be willing to dig in on that. So, hope that's encouraging. I just uh, wanted to provide you that thought. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Commissioner Malcolm. <laughs> Did you have a response? Yes, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Abler. I think you um, you really described quite well, and and Senator Morrison as well. A lot of the substance of the task force conversations was about exactly that, knowing. If there's going to, there are a lot of needs that the legislature is going to hear about and has heard about a, a lot of things that were raised here. Um, we didn't have agreement or uh, consensus on what a, what's the right timing, what, the, what are the right amounts, what are the right sources of of funds. But I think there was a shared appreciation for the fact that it's going to have to come from redesign and cost savings and uh, a better collective use of resources than, than what we have today. So your, your points are, are well taken um, uh, about the, the work yet to do just to, to really flesh out the details. And that's, that's really one of the things that we kept coming back to is we know this is, this is, these are ideas. They're, some of them are much more detailed than others. This is intended to sort of be directional and to start the next level of the conversation, which has to include all the stakeholders that you mentioned. Thank you. And just, um, I wanted to say too that I think the the task force members, you know, we did set forth these recommendations, but we really um, we didn't get to the level of detail about how they would be implemented. And I think that. Um, they're sorted into categories about who could take action on them, and some of them are legislative, you know, legislatively related. But I think it's it's going to be up to us to come up with, you know, what what are the items that need legislative action? Um, how can we develop bills that represent, you know, what we want to see happen? And then, you know, what is going to be left for other entities like the university to come forward with, um, you know, more um, specific plans. Uh, for me, the the big areas that I I hope we can um, dig into, you know, this session, knowing that it is not a you know year that we are going to be able to allocate uh, significant funding to this, um, you know, is how do we how do we best set ourselves up for next year when we do. Um, want to do budget planning and we want to take into consideration um, the university's proposals in a significant way. Um, what are the things that should happen in 2024 to, to make it possible for us to do that? Um, I also hope that we can um, talk more about and, and think more about you know the, the workforce planning that needs to happen and um, see if there's anything, any activities that we could have initiate you know, this year that don't cost a lot of money, but to help us get uh, closer to understanding, um, you know, how to do workforce planning in, in a more comprehensive way, because I think that's essential to, to making use of all of the professionals in our state and, and knowing that we, we desperately need more professionals in many areas. And then the, the other area that I think this year, um, you know, just having discussions about how to maximize um, you know, funding that we could draw down from the federal government, that's something that is in progress. 
how do we develop um, legislation to to examine that more carefully and and understand if there's things we could be doing this you know right away to to get that process going so I think there's a lot of ideas that could be um, advanced this year um, you know but I think the the overall um, as you mentioned the overall um, support for the university's ideas came with um, suggestions that we need more detail um, to be able to proceed with those so um, that that work is is something that needs to be done before we get to next session I think to to examine budget proposals um, Senator Mann Thank you madam chair. Um, thank you commissioner for the work you've done on this task force and also your previous work um, I just wanted to say that uh, because of the system that we have built, this for-profit system that prioritizes profits and money above patient care and patient outcomes, um, we have created a system that puts every hospital and every entity within the state at competition with each other. And we cannot have a successful system if that's happening. Um, and, and because I think healthcare is not a free market, that competition is detrimental to the health outcomes of all Minnesotans. Um, and, and the idea that we should depend or be dependent on wealthy donors to fund our education system, again, the system that every person in Minnesota depends on and every hospital in Minnesota depends on, I think is absolutely the wrong direction for us to be going. So this idea of, that you're speaking of, of rebuilding um, is, is really very important and very critical in the way we reimagine what healthcare can look like in the state. So I appreciate the conversation and, and again, the work that the task force is doing. Thank you. Any other member comments or questions? If not, um, I really appreciate your time and um, thank you again for coming, um, Chair Malcolm. And um, if members do have other questions, the report, um, you know, you know where to find it. If you have questions about any of the recommendations, please, you know, let me know or, or reach out to the Department of Health. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, now we will move. We have two bills that we will take um, take up today. Uh, both of them we will be laying over for future consideration. I just want to make, make, uh, let people know that. And first, um, we will be taking up Senator Mann's bill, Senate File 2508. And Senator Mann, um, welcome to the table, and please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, um, Senate File 2508 before you today is a very simple bill, um, and that clarifies the stroke levels of care in hospitals. So Minnesota currently has three levels of care, a comprehensive stroke center, which is the highest, a primary stroke center, and an acute stroke-ready hospital. Um, and for the last many several years, we've had a new uh, technology called a thrombectomy, which is a surgical removal of a blood clot. And so, um, the way that the statute is currently written, a hospital cannot be certified at that level of care because it's not in our statute since it's, since it's new. And so all this bill would do is it adds that level of care um, as, as the level between the first and the second level of stroke care, if that makes sense. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I have much smarter people here to testify. Thank you, and I, I think you have a testifier in person and then one on Zoom, so um, Mr. Stroyer, did you want to go first? Yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Dr. Christopher Streib, and I have the privilege of serving as the Stroke Medical Director for the University of Minnesota. And if also, you can pull the microphone a little bit closer. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, and and I, uh, my, my name is Dr. Christopher Streib, and I uh, am a stroke specialist. I am the Stroke Medical Director at the University of Minnesota, and also the Cerebral Vascular Director for M Health Fairview. Uh, I'm not a native Minnesotan, but I've been married to one for 10 years, and, and we're raising our three kids here. So as a proud adopted Minnesotan, I've had the privilege to take care of many Minnesotans with stroke. And uh, I'm here to, today to express my strong support for Senate File 2508, which adds thrombectomy-capable stroke center designation uh, to the list of stroke center designations for the Minnesota Department of Health. 
uh, as, as Senator Mann has, has already said, um, in 2013, legislation was passed that granted the Minnesota Department of Health the ability to designate stroke hospitals across the state. This was an especially successful uh, program, and in 10 years, uh, the number of Minnesotans that live within 30 uh, minutes of a designated stroke hospital has increased from 66% to 94%. This is especially critical because when we treat stroke, every minute matters. Delays of as little as five minutes can, uh, are associated with increased disability and death, and time is brain. So fortunately, there have been many advances in stroke treatment, uh, and as was discussed, thrombectomy is a minimally invasive surgery that removes large clots from the brains of patients with stroke. This is the type of stroke that's the most severe and typically led uh, patients to uh, really suffer permanent disability or death. Uh, and now these patients can be treated effectively and, and actually have complete recovery and, and walk out of the hospital. This uh, technology and capability and this designation as a thrombectomy capable stroke center is recognized in many states and by the American Heart Association and also the Joint Commission. Uh, but this technology and advancement um, uh, came after the original legislation that was passed in 2013. So I, I currently work um, within ML Fairview and we have hospitals that are designated at each level of, uh, of the current designation, including Southdale Hospital, uh, which is designated as a primary stroke center by, this, by the Minnesota Department of Health, but actually a thrombectomy capable stroke center by the Joint Commission. Southdale has invested uh, millions of dollars in infrastructure to be able to care for the sickest of stroke patients uh, and take care of them 24 seven around the clock, no matter when, uh, when a stroke occurs. So the thrombectomy capable stroke center designation uh, is not a uh, single hospital system issue. There are other thrombectomy capable stroke centers within uh, the state of Minnesota, including Mercy Hospital in Coon Rapids, which is in the Alina system, and uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Duluth, which is in the Duluth system. Recognizing thrombectomy capable stroke centers is a critical part of helping emergency medical services, first responders, and family members of patients with stroke identify the hospital that can provide them the right treatment uh, in the, the quickest possible manner. So I've dedicated my clinical career and research efforts to helping advance stroke care through novel therapies, emergent stroke treatment, and stroke prevention. I'm very grateful to Senator Mann for her willingness to bring this legislation forward and to the American Heart Association for their help in ensuring that Minnesotans will be able to receive superior stroke care when they need it most. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from uh, the committee. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll take the other testimony, and then we can open it for questions from members. Um, on Zoom, um, there is a Tom Lebotsky. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members for the opportunity to be here today to additionally provide testimony around uh, Senate uh, uh, Bill 2508. Um, my background is um, uh, 43 years in healthcare system operations, a lot of experience in clinical service lines, particularly in cardiovascular and neural sciences. I currently serve as the Vice President for Supply Chain at Alina Health, um, have uh, a vast experience in that side, but also, most importantly, have been working uh, over 25 years with the American Heart Association, currently today as a board member of the Twin Cities Heart Association and co-chair of the Advocacy Committee. So to reinforce, stroke is the sixth leading cause of death and major cause of disability in Minnesota today. The Minnesota Stroke Program currently recognizes Again, three levels of stroke care, comprehensive, primary, and acute. So adding a new designation of thrombectomy capable centers, as uh, mentioned, uh, certified by the Joint Commission, um, acknowledges the latest evidence of the benefits of thrombectomy, the surgical procedure to remove blood clots for treating large vessel acute ischemic stroke. This certification is designed for hospitals providing endovascular procedures and post-procedure care and from back to be capable designation would be a level two stroke center. The benefits uh, is clearly that the number of stroke patients who receive mechanical thrombectomy increased significantly in the U.S. over uh, the last several years. And so this procedure can save lives and prevent severe complications of stroke such as paralysis, bedriddenness, or speech loss. However, the procedure requires speed and precision and this is the key, key factor here. As the faster the brain's blood flow is restored, the better the chances of survival and recovery. 
Minnesota has the opportunity to continue leading the way and advancing the trauma systems of care by integrating thrombectomy capable centers within the current designation and registry system. Getting the right patient to the right facility at the right time for the appropriate care saves lives. The delay or disruption in care can put patients at risk and lead to worse outcomes overall. So to that end, the Minnesota Emergency Medical Services Acute Stroke Routing Tool recommends transporting patients to the closest endovascular capable stroke center, recognizing that thrombectomy capable comprehensive stroke centers can provide these services 24-7. So Bill Senate File 2508 would certainly ensure immediate access to safe care and also ensure that more Minnesota, Minnesotans can return home to their families and lives after suffering a stroke. As well, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, do you have any questions about the bill? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Mann, thanks for bringing this forward. Uh, I, I guess one of the questions that I do have is how many hospitals would currently qualify uh, under this new designation? Senator Mann? Madam Chair, Senator Liskey, right now it's four. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Mann, the, the reason why this is so important to me is actually a lot of people probably don't know this, but uh, my mom suffered a stroke at the age of 48. Um, I was the first person to respond, um, freshly out of chiropractic school. So luckily, knew the, knew the symptoms, knew what I was seeing, uh, knew how to respond uh, as fast as possible, basically directed anybody and everybody in the house on what we needed done right away, um, and kind of went from there. Uh, unfortunately, her, her stroke didn't get responded to as quickly as possible, or, you know, we were, we were in Mankato, but the response was not as well because the symptoms weren't identical or exact. Um, some of the things that she had going on didn't match up with the normal, normal stroke victim uh, symptoms. Just enough to know that it was a stroke, but not enough to know for sure what to do. Um, and they, they chose not to do the shot that they normally offer. And it, it turned out that it was a good thing because she ended up having a tear. So it would have actually made things worse, not better. Um, so at the end of the day, strokes are very near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate that this is being brought forward and hope that it continues on a good path. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other member questions? Um, I had just one question about, uh, so if there are four that are at this level, you know, how long a process is it to actually make it happen if, you know, if we pass the bill this year? So there, there are hospitals that are already uh, accredited as um, thrombectomy capable stroke centers and the Minnesota Department of Health would simply be able to recognize those uh, and then that would be integrated into sort of triage recommendations for the state of Minnesota. Okay. Thank you. If there aren't other questions, um, Senator Mann, did you have any final comments? Well, thank you for coming and thank you for the testifier on Zoom. I appreciate the information and uh, we will lay this bill over for uh, possible future consideration. Next, we have on the agenda Senate File 610, and that is Senator Bolden's bill. Bolden, when um, you're ready, I, I do believe you have a, an author's amendment. I do, Madam Chair. Would you like to adopt the amendment? And I would, Madam Chair. I would like to move the A1 amendment uh, just to get the bill in the form in which I would like to have it heard. Madam Chair. Um, Senator Abler. I just have a question. There's a, um, can Senator Bolden, can you tell me why on 2.8 you had it include, you, you, one of the significant Senator changes Abler. was you added uh, section 2, uh, underline 2.8. Can you just comment why that was necessary? Senator Abler, we're going to adopt the author's amendment, and then you can answer, you can ask questions about it. We'll allow the author to get the bill in the shape that she wishes it in, and she can present the bill. And if you have questions still at that point about a specific line, then 
when you I'm sure we've discussed this before. I think it's really bad. Someday when you're in the minority, you're going to hate it too. So it's just I, not good for the. It's not good for the state. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead and vote. And all those in favor of adopting the E1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. The, the amendment is adopted. Um, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I'll just, uh, from the outset, say the uh, amendment is um, clarification um, and came after um, some recommendations from the, uh, the Department of Health and some other conversations, so just clarifications there. Uh, so, committee members, this is a bill around uh, the health and safety of children and the ability for businesses to make uh, decisions about their business. Uh, this bill would allow licensed child care providers to make individual choices to manage the risk and best interests of their businesses and their customers, being very young children and their families. Currently, licensed child care facilities and public schools are combined in statute governing immunization law. Several exemptions to vaccine requirements are allowed, including medical exemptions, uh, exemptions for demonstrated immunity and personal beliefs. So this uh, Senate file 610 seeks to allow a specific group of independent businesses, being licensed childcare providers, the choice to make policy around immunizations only involving the last exemption, personal beliefs. So this bill does not change anything uh, related to the, the medical exemptions. Uh, and so those would continue to be, those other exemptions would continue to be honored. Uh, we know that infants are too young to get certain vaccines. Whether or not their parents plan to when they become eligible, they are all unprotected. This bill would simply allow each child care provider to make their own decision about accepting exemptions to vaccines only in the case of personal uh, parental preference. Child care providers are private businesses and should be allowed to choose the clients they serve, of course, within the bounds of anti-discrimination laws. So I want to be clear about what this bill does and does not do. This is not a mandate that all children have to be vaccinated to enroll in care. Uh, this is only uh, referencing the routine schedule of childhood vaccinations. This bill is about individual provider choice and their what is best for their business. It is about protecting the health of our most vulnerable. And it's incredibly and continually relevant. Just yesterday, um, and you'll see this in your packets, MDH sent a warning letter to child care providers letting them know of a current outbreak in Dakota County uh, of the measles and to be on high alert for spread. I think it's worth noting uh, that there are child care providers on both sides of this issue, so those that would continue accepting parental objections to vaccines and those who would consider uh, adopting policies not to enroll children unvaccinated due to parental preference. This bill simply creates the choice for providers who are running these businesses about how they want to manage risk in their programs. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, I, uh, we do have some testifiers. Thank you, uh, Senator Bolden. And so uh, we'll go to um, Claire Sanford. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Claire Sanford, and I serve on the board of the Minnesota Child Care Association, or MCCA. MCCA supports this bill, as this issue has been of significant concern to many of our members over many years. There's much anxiety among many child care providers, given the very young and vulnerable population we serve, as well as our status as private businesses, that child care and public schools live in the same immunization statute, and both are included in the personal belief exemption with no flexibility. Measles has always been the scariest threat, um, to childcare, as the disease declared eliminated in the year 2000 has reemerged continuously as community vaccination rates have dipped over the intervening decades, it is very much not eliminated. And measles in a child care program is a nightmare that no one wants. This is not a case of strep throat. It spreads like wildfire. And all unvaccinated children when exposure occurs, which can be all the infants in a program, including any other children in the program who are not vaccinated against this, have to be quarantined for a minimum of 21 days. 
That's three weeks of fear for those families waiting to see if their children get sick, three weeks of no childcare and potential time away from work and economic harm to those families, and three weeks of lost income for providers. And we know the instability in the childcare system that we're very much working on, and some providers cannot manage uh, that long without that revenue. You'll hear more about the potential severity of diseases like measles for very young children um, from an upcoming testifier who is the medical expert that I am not, and there are certainly medical experts on this committee. And child care providers are simply asking that they, as private businesses, have the ability to choose an option to better manage this significant health risk within their programs because it affects their customers, their staff, and their livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have um, Sheldon Berkowitz. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and, um, and begin your testimony. And also, um, I forgot to mention, but it's important that those who come to the table, please um, sign in on the sign-in sheet. So thank you. Go ahead. Chair Wicklin and members, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Dr. Sheldon Berkowitz and I'm a retired pediatrician having worked for over 20 years at Children's Minnesota Hospital. I'm also the immediate past president of the Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, an organization representing over 1,000 pediatricians around our state. I am here today to speak in support of Senate File 610 to allow child care centers or family child care programs to require fully vaccinated status of all attendees older than two months old unless there is a medical exemption to being vaccinated. This legislation will lead to increased rates of vaccination among all children, making our communities, schools, and our kids safer and healthier. During my lifetime and medical career, I've been fortunate to see vaccinations developed that have made diseases such as polio, various forms of bacterial meningitis, measles, and multiple other diseases almost unheard of in the US. I've also seen what happens when vaccination rates in the community decrease, putting children and adults at serious risk. For most vaccine preventable diseases, if at least 95% of the population is vaccinated against that disease, the chances of unvaccinated individuals spreading a disease are very low. However, if vaccination rates drop below 95%, then community immunity drastically decreases and we are at all at risk of getting sick. Unfortunately, starting before the COVID pandemic, but continuing to this day, we are starting to see childhood vaccination rates decline well below that 95% mark. In some cases, parents are refusing vaccinations based on religious beliefs or things that they have heard from friends or read in the news or on social media or simply a belief that their child doesn't need the vaccination. Whatever the reason is, declining recommended vaccinations not only puts their own child at risk, but also other children around them. In the U.S. as a whole, but also in Minnesota, vaccination rates have decreased to levels that put us all at risk. We saw this only days ago when MDH reported that a pair of unvaccinated siblings from Dakota County contracted measles a disease that can cause significant medical problems or death and for which we've had a vaccination since 1963. In 2023, the Centers for Disease Control noted that nationally only 93% of children entering kindergarten were fully vaccinated. In Minnesota, according to MDH data for the 2022-23 school year, vaccination rates were even worse. Just under 90% of all children entering Public school kindergarten were fully vaccinated. This dropped to 82% for private schools and only 73% for charter schools. The rates of parents using non-medical or personal belief exemptions range from 4 to 10% for these children. Most childhood vaccinations occur between two months of age and two years of age with boosters at kindergarten and then other vaccinations and boosters around middle school. By removing the non-medical exemption for child care centers and family child care programs, our chances of getting all children fully vaccinated and our community vaccination rates back up to 95% or higher will improve. 
I urge you to vote in favor of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Joe, and I'm, I apologize if I say your name wrong, Piquet, or Piquet, yeah. Piquet. And you can go ahead and take a seat in the... Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record. Sure. Uh, my name is Joe Paquette. Uh, I'm the owner-operator of two child care facilities, uh, one in Maple Grove and one in Brooklyn Park. And I'm here today to express my support for Senate File 610. Um, for me, there's two things about this bill that kind of give me some passion around it. One is business freedom. I'm a small business owner. I operate my business. I should be able to set my policies for how I interact with my customers, how I choose my customers. As long as I'm not violating state discriminatory laws, I feel like those decisions should rest with that small business owner. So that's one part of this bill that I especially stand strong on. The second part is what I do in my business, I'm entrusted with the care and protection of young children. Um, I have to look parents in the eye and tell them that I'm going to keep their kids safe. For me personally, that means making sure I minimize risk of any illnesses spreading throughout my center. Um, I want to make sure that the children in my care are doing everything that I think is necessary to protect themselves and others in that center. If I have to deal with an outbreak, I have to be the one as a small business owner to look in their parents' eyes and tell them, I did everything I could, but when that child is sitting in a hospital, or God forbid even passes, I'm the one they're looking at to say, why did you not protect my child? So I take that particular responsibility very, very seriously, and I want to make sure that the uh, parents know that I'm doing everything in my power to try to, uh, to protect them, and that's why I'm here today. Um, I don't enjoy the same protections that the schools enjoy. If an outbreak happens in a schools, parents can't go to a school and you know, sue them or go after them like they can me, a private business. I, I was left alone to try to explain to them what happened and try to defend my, uh, my actions. So I'm just asking that this bill be supported so that we as private business owners, as small business owners, as private child care facilities have the ability to set policies that we feel are fair um, for us and to our businesses or to our customers. Um, to me, it's a bill about choice. It's a bill about who gets to make those choices. I have no problem with parents who want to make choices not to vaccinate. That is their choice. But I should be able to have the choice to decide if I'm going to bring children that are unvaccinated into my center so that I can calculate the risk of that choice. And if I don't want to and I want to protect children because I believe vaccinations are important, I should be able to be able to make that choice. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could sign in on the sign-in sheet, I appreciate it. Thank you. And next, um, we'll move to testifiers on Zoom. We do have a couple other public members who are on the list, and they will. We will get back to you, to the the in public in person members who want it, or members of the public who wish to testify. Um, first on Zoom, I'd like to call on Annette Meeks. And well, thank you. Please state your name for the record and and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Annette Meeks, and I'm the CEO of the Freedom Foundation in Minnesota. We're a nonprofit educational organization based in Minneapolis. I'm here today to discuss concerns about the importance of childhood immunizations on small businesses, in particular child care centers and providers. For many years prior to COVID, we had a small but important group uh, that met regularly to discuss immunizations and how to best educate our fellow citizens uh, throughout the state about our declining acceptance rate uh, of life-saving childhood immunizations. I regret our group no longer exists, but I'm here today to talk about this important issue before the committee today. It's something our immunization group discussed nearly a decade ago as an important goal. As a result of our group's work and research done by the Freedom Foundation of Minnesota several years ago, we issued a report on Minnesota's declining rate of childhood vaccinations and what could be done about it. We started the report talking about Jonas Salk and his development of the polio vaccine. I reread that yesterday and I'm visit prior to visiting with you and I was struck by how different the reaction is in recent years about childhood vaccines that keep our children safe from once eradicated diseases. After all we've been through during the global pandemic of COVID, it's hard to believe we Minnesotans can come together 
uh, about this issue, but I believe that the legislature has an opportunity to do so with this legislation. Senate File 610 provides immunization flexibility for child care centers and providers, allowing each small business, and I, I must stress these are private small businesses, many of whom serve very young children, including newborns, some of whom are ineligible to receive vaccines due to their age. This is a compromise legislation to allow those businesses to make their own decisions about accepting exemptions to vaccines for the children and families they serve. I don't need to tell you, as several testifiers have already uh, brought forth the facts about our child care crisis and certainly our immunization crisis. This legislation would allow those private businesses, each of whom will have the choice to continue to accept children whose parents object to vaccinations, while others will adopt policies to not enroll unvaccinated children for their own businesses and personal reasons. This is not about COVID-19. This is about individual provider choices for small businesses throughout the state, allowing them to have the choice to further manage risk in their programs for their workers and their families they serve. Uh, I was struck also yesterday working through this, many of you were not in the legislature in 2011 when Minnesota had 26 reported cases of measles and again in 2017 when regretfully Minnesota led the nation with 75 cases of measles. I kept my files from those days and, and discovered that the Minnesota Department of Health in 2017, so nearly uh, eight years ago during the measles outbreak when 76 or 75 children were struck and hospitalized, that the cost per individual uh, early on in the epidemic was nearly a million dollars per facility. That's a lot of money to ask a small business to, to absorb in, in this case where they have to manage the risk and this gives them the choice of how best to manage the risk. Thankfully, none of those children died as a result of being non-vaccinated, but we have an opportunity here to help our small businesses, in particular childcare providers, to be trusted to manage that risk. We continue to share your mission of spreading the truth of educating our fellow citizens about childhood vaccines and their importance. We believe that providing factual information about the dangers surrounding the declining rates of childhood immunization in Minnesota, as well as the safety and efficacy of available vaccines will help parents and policymakers, and most importantly, in this case, small businesses make the best decision for the health of all their children. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the opportunity to visit with you today about this. Thank you. Um, next, um, I would ask Nicole Flick, um, and I will ask the testifiers if um, you can um, keep your testimony between two and three minutes. We do want to get through the testimony and then be able to have member discussion. So uh, if you have a point that, that has been made, if you can summarize and, and um, keep your, your testimony focused to your unique messages, I'd appreciate that. So, oh, I have been told that Nicole Flick is not on the Zoom. Um, let's go to Sarah Flick, is she? Hello, I'm here, uh, no relation. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Flick. I am here as a resident of Rochester and as a mom of two young children, seven and one. I'm here to advocate for this legislation to ensure the health and well-being of our youngest and most vulnerable Minnesotans, our children. The importance of these vaccinations in preventing the spread of infectious diseases have been stated by those far more qualified than I. These vaccines have played a pivotal role in safeguarding public health and contributing to the overall well-being of our community. My youngest is not yet two years old and she went to daycare today. And today parents like me struggle with the spread of disease, especially during this time of year and the fragile for a few months of life, flu, RSV, COVID, these are all commonplace. And to balance these illnesses as a family of two working parents is a struggle. I worry with vaccinations declining, we will see the continued rise of far more serious illness. We expect parents to send their children to care facilities in order to return to work, in my opinion, far too quickly. So it's important that if we are to send our children, we provide a safe environment for these young and vulnerable Minnesotans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Brianna Bergman. Is she on the Zoom? Yes, I am. If you can state your name for the record and begin. 
I first want to thank you, um, Madam and Committee, and my name is Brianna Bergman. I have been an early child care substitute for the state of Minnesota for the past eight years, and I have been to over 200 centers. I am the front line of disease and illness because I am who they call when they don't have staffing anymore, and I am opposing this bill today. I'm opposing this bill today because I know the ins and outs of child care facilities and it will remove care from over 80% of parents who choose against it. And it's not parents that just choose against it. It is only even one, if you are missing one vaccine, they will no longer be allowed in those facilities, even one. And when there are 17 different ones, if a child has a reaction to only one, medical exemptions will only be for that one vaccine that they had a reaction to, even if the provider does not believe they should be vaccinated in the future. Um, and 80% of the communities will no longer, for one, the wait lists are already one to three years to get into a facility to begin with. I have had to have that conversation many times with parents. I, so it's already hard enough to get childcare. You have to sign up to multiple the moment you get pregnant. And even then, you have to hope that you will get in by the time the child is ready to be in child care. And then to lose 80% plus, because we just had someone testify that they only own two and are in support of this bill and will not be accepting the personal belief exemptions, which people would need if the medical exemption only covers one vaccine and it's not recommended to have any more. And I know for a fact that one of the biggest top corporation daycares already denies medical exemptions, which shouldn't be allowed, but it hasn't been challenged. And they provide care for the majority of the state. I know several of the other corporations will also deny care. And I know for a fact it'll be over 80% loss. And those wait lists for the people who need, actually need these exemptions will rise to three to five years easily and what are parents supposed to do? It doesn't leave parents a choice anymore at that point. Parents don't have a choice when they have to choose the state, the, they have to choose between the finances to be able to provide a roof over their head for their children and food in their stomachs and choose between that and the well being of their child. And I am here today because I was also a frontline center of the 2007 measles pandemic, and I was a substitute for that. And the rate was so minimal that I went to, I, I, went, I went through my files, I went to 135 centers during that time, and I, there was not a single case. And I just would like to support family choice because those families already have minimal choice to begin with. And I thank you for your time, and that's all I have for today. Thank you. Uh, next testifier is Melissa Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I do have this written so that I can be um, um, careful of your time. So my name is Melissa Schultz. I'm here today as a representative for both Minnesotans for Health and Parental Rights and as a parent of a child who utilizes conscientious objections for medical reasons. Um, firstly, we have concerns that Senate File 610 violates Minnesota discrimination laws. So Minnesota has a very diverse population and with that does come diverse religious beliefs. And if this bill were to pass, it would allow daycares to discriminate against an individual's religion. And as you know, religion in Minnesota is a protected class under the Minnesota Human Rights Act. So denying a child entrance due to their religion is legally equivalent to denying them due to their race, their disability, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, etc. So there is a longer list of potential legal conflicts. Um, I won't name them now, but you should all have written testimony from us that does kind of outline some of the other um, legal implications. And it's also important to note that other states, such as Mississippi recently, um, have undergone legal battles in this matter. Um, and in those states, they were required by courts to reinstate exemptions due to discrimination law. Next, we also question the necessity of such a bill. Um, children in daycare settings are always in various stages of vaccination. Children receive 40 vaccinations between birth and kindergarten if they follow the CDC recommended schedule. So infants entering a facility 
will typically only have one of those 40. And it's not until they are actually leaving childcare for kindergarten that they are considered fully vaccinated. Even when looking at this week's measles case, um, the child would still have been el eligible under this law due to their age. Um, so since child care centers always have unvaccinated or partially vaccinated children, it begs the question, what does this bill aim to achieve since they will never reach fully vaccinated status in, their ch in the children in their care? We would also uh, encourage that the committee look at this issue through an equity lens. Conscientious objections are not only used by people who are opposed to all vaccination. Healthcare disparities lead people to use conscientious objections instead of seeking out costly medical exemptions. Even getting your annual form filled out can require healthcare, time off of work, travel, and expense. Simply put, conscientious objections um, are free and accessible options to everybody, particularly those in rural Minnesota and underserved communities. Exemptions are also not only used by citizens who decline all vaccines, Payers by families that have a delayed schedule or a modified schedule or those who oppose only one or a few. Exemptions are required to opt out or even delay um, one dose of any of those in the series that's recommended. And in my case, we used conscientious obje objections um, while exploring a complex medical diagnosis. So we understand the importance of public health measures and also believe that citizens need to have the ability to make private individualized healthcare decisions. Minnesota has always been really great at finding a balance between public health and individualized care. And this was done by allowing exemptions. If you didn't know, um, our history of exemptions actually goes all the way back to 1905 when we passed a law that no child could be compelled to um, receive or be excluded due to their smallpox vaccination. So Minnesota's current law really respects our successful history at keeping Ms. a Schultz, balance. If you, could, help. if you can please summarize and, and end your, yep. thank you. Um, so our current law respects the balance between public health and individualized care, and we're simply asking to keep the current law. Um, so in conclusion, I respect that you um, Respectfully urge you to reconsider Senate File 610 and carefully evaluate the legal and personal implications of this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next, I have Elena, and I'm I'm sorry if I mispronounce Nihaf. And right. um, again, I would appreciate it if you could keep to less. Chuck than Finley's three here minutes. too, and you, you skip me. Oh, okay. I was informed that you were not, but um, let's go ahead with um, Ms. Nihaf if you could go ahead. Okay. Madam Chair and the committee members, my name is Elena Nihoff. I'm a registered nurse from Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm testifying against the bill SF-610. This bill encroaches on a sacred relationship between a parent and their child, the ability of a parent to decide what is good for the child and what is not, to raise the child according to their personal religious beliefs and convictions. Your bill simply forces the parents to trust the government. I have a simple question. Can our government be trusted? Here is an example. Recently, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, made a rule to authorize certain experimental human clinical trials to function without obtaining informed consent from the participant. It means that if a vaccine is placed on a certain clinical trial, not even the doctor will know what is in, in, in the vaccine at the time of administration. By this rule, FDA, a federal agency, violated basic human rights, which are protected by the Nuremberg Code and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But Senator Baldwin simply telling the parents to blindly trust the government. Bill SF-610 <coughs> violates autonomy, freedom of thoughts, conscience, and religious beliefs of Minnesota. Legislative branch is giving authority to write the laws within the boundaries of the Constitution. Bill SF-610 is an attempt to infringe on parental rights. Parental rights are encoded in Constitution of the United States. 
any attempt to rewrite the Constitution is illegal and unconstitutional by itself. Please vote no on the bill SF 610. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there a Chuck Finley on the call? We did not I, see I'm here. I'm Chuck so. Finley. Okay. If you can please um, turn your video on and then please oh. state your name for the record and uh, begin your testimony. Let's see. And can you? I don't know how video works. Uh, hold on. Okay, if you, if you can't, um, please proceed, but please state your name for the record um, before you proceed. It's okay if you don't have the video ab ability. And now it looks like you're, you're maybe muted. Um, is that, and that's his. Um, can you unmute your um, sound, Mr. Finley? Yeah, sorry about that. I can't figure out the video. I've done it before, so it's kind of, so I'm sorry. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, we can. Please, please proceed. Okay, you should have a packet of PowerPoint that I send, so if you don't have it, this may not make as much sense because I'm going to go through the slides. The reason we're all here today is the FDA and CDC, more, is, and, the, and the marketing arm is the same agency as the regulatory side. But the marketing arm is, has irresponsibly taken over. Now this committee is smart, and all I ask is for you to look at the data says, not what the performative propaganda says. So here's my joke. My grandparents died before my parents were born. It's been very hard for my family. Why is this funny? Everyone born before 1954 is presumed to have measles. Let's take a quick look at polio, polio polioeradication.org. Our polio vaccine, IPV, does not eradicate polio. We switched from the oral polio, polio vaccine, OPV, which did eradicate polio because it was too dangerous. The main symptom, paralysis, very bad. If you go to my PowerPoint slide seven, we can look at a clinical trial comparison. Hepatitis B given the first day of life. The CDC has said there's been zero cases of transmission in a school setting. The clinical trial is 147 patients monitored for five days with no placebo. Now you've been a science class, you need a placebo to know the risks. Even NexGuard, a vaccine for dogs, has a placebo, its time was 90 days, which is 20 times more, and the patients were 615 dogs. Why do we accept vaccines or require them when it's less robust than dog vaccines? Now, a good clinical trial would be dengue, which is 35,000 participants and monitored for 72 months with a placebo. If we go to slide five, you have the entire list the FDA says is causal, is causal. It's a causal relationship with hepatitis, hepatitis B, and that includes paralysis, seizures, syncope, gambare, uticara, and there's about 30 other ones that are causal according to the FDA. But we don't know how common they are because we don't have good clinical trial data, which we should actually require. Now, let's, if we go to slide 11, the consensus paper that whooping cough, Tdap, pertussis, the vaccine does not prevent transmission and an infection. That means you do not have herd immunity. There is no herd immunity. The effectiveness after one vaccine, after one year goes down to 68.8%, and then it goes down to 8.9% effective, and that's just symptoms. Just the symptoms go down to 8.9% be between two and four years. And it does not prevent transmission and infection. There is no herd immunity. Now, if we go to slide 15 on the CDC website, this is very defamatory. It says, vaccines do not cause autism, okay? But then it has a link. It has a source, adverse events of vaccines, event and causality by the Institute of Medicine. So if you click on that link and you go to page 554 of, of, the, of what the Minnesota Institute of, the, the Institute of Medicine has said, and this is what is referenced by the CDC as evidence. It says, there is no evidence that is insufficient and, or absent to assess an association between the pertussis vaccine and autism. That means they don't know. So the propaganda arm says, hey, the vaccines don't cause autism. But when you look at the sources they cite, it says, hey, we actually don't have any data that concludes for or against that it does. So we actually don't have any good data if the vaccines are safe or not safe. And we do know that the effectiveness is shaky at best. Mr. Finley, so if you can you have wrap to, up your thoughts, please. I'll wrap it up in one second. So you have to conclude. 
that if you personally should either go get a Tdap vaccine every year because the effectiveness goes down to 60% after one year, or you should take a closer look at the data because what the data says is alarming. Thanks. Thank you. Next on the list, I have Drew Dito. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Uh, yes. If you can please uh, state your name for the record and begin, and please keep your testimony three minutes or less. Thank you. My name is Drew Deidel. Uh, I completed medical school in my home state at the University of Nebraska, graduating in 2016. And I came to Minnesota to train in family medicine at Hennepin Healthcare, and I completed that training in 2019. I have worked as a physician at North Point Health and Wellness Clinic since 2019, and my comments do not reflect my employer. Uh, serving the residents of Hennepin County as a physician has informed my perspective, which I came to share with the committee. I am engaged in, in the work of caring. I go to work every day for the benefit of my patients and working in a low income neighborhood, I witness a lot of suffering. Depression, drug addiction, violence, chronic pain, hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune issues, mental illness and homelessness, the list goes on. I talk with my patients about lifestyle, about exercise and nutrition, about calming the mind down with breathing techniques, and I ask them about prayers or religious practices from their family or their culture that brings them comfort. Of course, uh, people need their basic health screenings and medications, but one of the best things that I really do for my patients in their situations is to make sure that they feel heard, that they know someone uh, is caring and advocating for them. I understand that over the last four years, compliance with the CDC recommended schedule of routine vaccinations has declined. In my role as a physician, I meet parents who have questions or wish to delay administration of the recommended schedule. I am concerned that requiring compliance under the penalty of losing access to child care will further erode trust of our system. When moms come to me and they don't trust the system, I aim to meet them where they are and to provide the information at the level that they can understand. If they are resistant, I might not be able to overcome that and the legal system shouldn't force the issue and bypass their sovereignty. In the short term, it may work in some cases to increase the numbers, but the bigger problem becomes the declining trust in our medical system and our government, making the work that I set out to do all the more difficult. I urge you to vote against SF 610. Thank you for your attention and God bless. Thank you. Um, last on Zoom, we have Megan Cloak. And if you could. Hi, I'm Megan Cluck. And thank you, M Madam and Committee. Um, I am a nutritional therapist, and my expertise um, prior to serving those with cancer has been in working with children with vaccine injuries. And prior to um, receiving my master's degree in counseling, I worked with a family for many months who had a vaccine injured child. And previously I was not aware that vaccine injuries were actually something that families experienced. But living with this family day to day, life was a struggle. Their son literally could not sweat. Their son was nonverbal, which prior to his vaccinations that were on schedule, he was verbal and became nonverbal. This was horrifying to me and something that I actually was exposed to many times after this first family that I worked with. The families that I worked with for many years had many different symptoms from vaccine injuries with very little support. Pharmaceutical companies that create these vaccines have legal immunity according to the Vaccine Injury Act. If a child is vaccine injured, they cannot directly sue the pharmaceutical companies that have created the vaccine. Vaccines are created with many fillers and many components that are used to stabilize the vaccine. However, these fillers have a huge ability to cause reactions in people that are already compromised. For example, the flu shot contains mercury, 
Mercury is a neurotoxin. Mercury is also within thermometers. And if you break a thermometer and mercury comes into your home, you're supposed to not touch it because of how toxic mercury is. And yet, mercury is an adjunct to the flu shot. Thus, if parents were forced to follow the CDC schedule and get a flu shot every year, their child every year would be exposed to mercury. And they would have no idea if their child would have an adverse reaction until the adverse reaction occurs. They are not allowed um, with, to have a medical exemption, exemption prior to a vaccine injury. So this is not about personal preference. This is about belief. There's also a case in New York City of a mother who was Catholic, who is pro-life, who sued the state because of not wanting to immunize her child because vaccines are, the viruses in vaccines are cultured with aborted fetal cell lines. If you are pro-life and you are against abortion, this is against your belief against aborting children. I am personally pro-life and I will not give my child a vaccine that contains aborted fetal cell lines. This Ms. Clark, is a drug. If you can please yes? um, complete your thought and, and yes, we need I to move love on to. to the next testifier. Thank you. The Minnesota rule 9502 states, no caregiver shall discriminate in relation to admissions on basis of religion, race, creed, color, national origin, or sex. Religious beliefs, including beliefs about abortion, are important in this statute and in this bill. If this bill goes forward, people that are pro-life and not in favor of abortion are then forced to violate their own conscientious beliefs. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, we have one more um, testifier, Nicole Flick. Um, she was not able to join earlier, and now I'd like to have, allow her time if she's on. Yep, I'm here. And if you could um, state your name for the record, and if you can keep your testimony um, around two, two and a half minutes, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, my name is Nicole Flick. I own ABC123 Child Enrichment Center in Dilworth, Minnesota, which is right outside the Fargo-Moorhead area. I have work been working in the early childhood education field for 19 years, owning my own child private child care center for the last eight years. Um, this bill particularly allows the provider like me to choose the, to use their best judgment when it comes to immunizations and the children in their care. When you ask a provider what the worst thing that could happen to a child under their care is, they're not going to say death, they're going to say a communicable disease, an outbreak. Um, the liability to the other children in our care versus the one child has to take precedent. Um, I've been through this scenario where I thought a child had measles. Um, I followed all the steps, I contacted the health department, and the best thing I could do off of their advice was to watch for symptoms. At this point, I had lost families, income, and my reputation was at stake. It turns out the child just had hand, foot, and mouth, and the parent took the child to a naturopathist instead of an actual physician. And once they took him to a physician, they found out it actually was just a small virus. Now, even the small virus, all of my infants got it. So had it been measles, all of my infants would have gotten it. Um, as a provider who lives this day, lives this life day in and day out, we need, we need to make, be able to make sure that our children are safe from disease that could kill them. And the parents who are enrolling their children expect us to keep them safe. Um, parents have every right to enroll their child in any program they see fit. However, as a provider, we should also have the right to choose if we wanna take the risk of having unvaccinated children in the same building as infants whose parents cannot yet vaccinate due to age. The risk to young infants who cannot be immunized and attracting, attracting a disease like measles could not only create a new pandemic, but the death toll would be outright dangerous and preventable. Just yesterday, I received an email from the Department of Health that there are, is an outbreak of measles in the state of Minnesota, and we are to watch for symptoms because it spreads like wildfire. Um, so it does happen because people are not vaccinating their children. 
Uh, we know the science behind the vaccines. We also understand the parents' right to religion and their choice on how to raise their children. However, when their choice can affect how other children live or die, we have to be real here. I should have the right as a private child care provider as well, within the laws, of course. Fully funding child care would give the state the right to keep this law. However, since there are no plans to do that, we are, we are private small businesses, not schools, as you made that very clear. So I support this bill 100%, and so do several providers that I am um, in colleagues with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to call up Patty Carroll and Diane Smith, the last two testifiers that I have on my list. If you could both please come up to the table and provide your testimony. And I would ask that you keep your um, testimony to things that um, maybe haven't been presented and uh, limit your time to um, less than two and a half minutes because we do only have a very short time left um, with members and I want to allow them to have a discussion. So, um, Patty Carroll, if you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Yes. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Patty Carroll, and I am the founder of the Vaccine Safety Council of Minnesota. We're a 501c4 with the simple mission of preventing injuries and deaths from vaccines. Uh, my question about Senate File 610 is why? Um, I've studied vaccine policy for the last 23 years after my son suffered permanent brain damage from vaccines. So when the COVID mania began ramping up, I was way ahead of the game on decoding all the government fear mongering and misinformation. Creating crises to strike fear in people is nothing new. Whenever there's a bill introduced to take away our freedom to choose, you can pretty much count on a scary outbreak of measles or some new variant to suddenly dominate the media. But people have learned a lot about vaccines in the last four years. They got to see how the sausage is made, and they can't unsee how ugly it is. FOIA requests yielded stunning facts about mismanaged clinical trials, the shocking number of injuries and deaths, and our government's own role in attempting to cover these things up. I've heard some clearly indoctrinated people talking about protecting kids or saving them from death by not allowing non-vaccinated kids near them. This is exactly the sort of hysteria our government and their pharma partners strive for and pay billions of dollars to create. What the government doesn't readily admit is that the FDA's licensure standards for vaccines do not require demonstration of the prevention of infection or transmission. So by FDA's own licensing standards, there is no such thing as a vaccine preventable disease. Vaccinated children can get and spread disease just as much, if not more, than non-vaccinated kids. They also don't admit that vaccines are not tested for safety in the combinations they routinely inject into our babies or that vaccine manufacturers spend almost twice as much money on advertising as they do on research and development. They don't need to do R&D, they should, to create safe and actually effective vaccines, but when vaccines cause injury or death, which is readily admitted by the government and the very reason they passed the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986, the makers of these products cannot be held liable even if there was a known design defect of the vaccine. So with what we know now, and with more truth coming to light every day, how could you even think about allowing daycare providers to force ineffective and liability-free products on children as a prerequisite to attending daycare? Senate File 610 is pointless because vaccines don't protect anyone. It's discriminatory and it could force parents to put their children in harm's way just so that they can go to work and earn a living to support their families. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Ms. Smith, please state your name for the record. And um, Ms. Carroll, if you can please sign in on the sign-in sheet as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. My name is Diane Smith, and um, I recognize many of your familiar faces because I have been up and down the halls um, greeting you and for the last at least 10 years and um, I have yet to meet with some of you still so it's nice to see some faces I have not met yet. I have been um, a mother who's experienced a horrible adverse reaction to two of my children. 
I vaccinated my children. I did what you are asking. And it took three years in a row of emergency room visits to finally wake up and to say, oh, perhaps it was the vaccines. And it turns out I was right. Because when I stopped vaccinating my kids, they stopped going to the emergency room. Imagine that. And it was shocking to me. And I didn't believe it for three years. But now I understand. I have a compilation, very thick, in this booklet of vaccine inserts. So in these inserts, it explains very thoroughly what can happen to your child or even you as an adult with administration of a vaccine. So it is not new, okay? It's all here. It's just not told to parents when we bring our kids into the doctor visits unless we really know to ask. Here is a booklet, thanks to Patty Carroll of Vaccine Safety Council. Tons of stories, and it's just a, just a glimmer of stories. There are so many more of vaccine-injured children and adults. And some of you have this booklet, and some of you I, I will give to you that you may not have received it yet, but it's a wake-up call. We do not need to go around asking, where are your papers? Show me your papers for you to enter this facility. Where have we heard that before, folks? For those of us old enough to know, that came right out of Nazi Germany. That came out in the 40s. You don't enter here without your papers. We don't live in those times, folks. We went to war and we lost grandparents because of that war. In June of 2019, over $4 billion was paid out by the National Vaccine Compensation Program. We have a problem and we're, not, we're ignoring the elephant in the room. So for any uh, child care provider to develop an immunization policy is absurd. Policies to be um, thought about is for a parent with their doctor if they Ms. choose Smith. to, Ms. Smith, to please, develop. Please wrap up your So thoughts. thank you. I appreciate that, Madam Chair. <laughs> so my final closing is this is not up to any center or business to say, hey, you can't come in here unless you're vaccinated. Because guess what happens? Then it spreads to schools. Pretty soon schools are going to shut down any family wanting to enter into their building and then businesses and then eventually um, nursing uh, home facilities. So anyway, folks, I'd like to stop this before it gets out of hand. I really thank you for your time. Please consider how detrimental this would be if um, you approve this bill. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, members, we will stop at 10 minutes to 11 because we do have session today. So I want to allow for some discussion time. But um, as I said earlier, we are going to lay the bill over. And I would not you know, bring it for a vote without allowing for additional discussions if we aren't able to have a sufficient time at this point. So members, um, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, at this time, I'd like to offer the A2 amendment. Uh, Senator Liskey offers the A2 amendment that will be passed out. Can you describe the amendment for us? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the amendment itself is to uh, represent a lot of the uh, talk we've already heard here today uh, in this discussion. Um, and basically, it's to give back the rights of full body autonomy to the patients and to separate legislation from the decision between a doctor and their patient um, and things like that. Uh, the reason I bring this amendment is it is going to give conscientious objection back into the patient's rights um, and, and, their, and their ability to object correctly. The purpose for this is multiple. Um, first of all, I am actually a person who suffered from an adverse reaction due to a um, vaccination when I was a child. Uh, this led to my parents choosing to delay uh, vaccinations over a course of time. And so according to the way the 610 is written prior to my amendment, it would be, I would, un, I would have been unable to attend a child care facility um, because I had to delay how quickly or how slowly I could get such, uh, such vaccines. Um, 
With that being said, I also have my children who have had delayed vaccines, and because of that, they don't get a medical exemption. Uh, the, the doctors refuse to write medical exemptions, especially these days, because they're afraid to lose licensing and things of that nature. Um, it's held over their head. If they write these exemptions, unless there's a perfect, well-documented uh, reason, they generally hold off. Um, it's the same reason as to why I have yet to get a medical exemption for vaccination statuses. With that being said, um, hopefully we can have a good discussion about why uh, body, body autonomy is important, um, and we can go from there. Thank you. Senator Bolden, do you have a response? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, committee members, I would uh, urge a no vote on this amendment. It essentially undoes what the bill is aiming to do. Um, I just would... Um, add uh, just maybe a correction, uh, Senator Liske, to your comments. Um, you know, in your case, it, it wouldn't ban you from all child care centers. It, you know, really just to kind of reiterate and refocus us on what this bill does, it, it allows uh, private businesses, child care centers, to make their own decisions and their own policies. Um, and so, again, there are folks on both sides of this issue, and so uh, you know, not every child care center is is going to uh, disallow uh, children uh, without vaccines. And so, um, uh, for that reason, I, I would ask for a no vote on this uh, amendment. Senator Ebler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd request a roll call, then I have some comments. Senator Ebler requests a roll call. Roll call granted. Will be granted. Any other comments about Madam the amendment Chair. before we vote? Senator well, Ebler. Yeah, and I. Um, I don't know why we're doing this bill. Um, I don't know that debating vaccines again is going to help in the drawn abortion debate, which we've had a lot of, and people's conscientious beliefs. Um, I think the testimony was really good testimony. I think uh, the people that are promoting the idea of this bill uh, made their, uh, you know, a, a worthy case. I think um, the more worthy case, however, is above all, do no harm. And the ability of conscientious objectors to object. And conscientious objectors just don't make up random beliefs. Um, there are, we, we've discussed this just so much, and it seems as though the people who favor vaccinations don't listen and don't comprehend science and listen to people who provide um, the testimony about what has happened. There are thousands and thousands of adverse reactions to vaccines. Does that mean we shouldn't vaccinate? No. It does not mean that at all, but it means that people need to be allowed to consider with their doctor uh, what's going on, and many doctors aren't informed. And so to get an exemption letter um, from a doctor these days may bring a, a doctor up before disciplinary action at their board uh, because of the strong belief in the industry. And as you look at the uh, spate of letters that we've gotten, there's nurses, there's the doctor there even pointed out that this may be counterproductive, even though he probably wishes that people would be vaccinated more. And I don't think it's the role of this legislature, and I don't believe it's the heart of the Democratic Party, to take away freedom from people to properly investigate their health care choices and, and their own children. Um, we have had I cannot remember how many vaccine discussions we've had in hearings and outside where people did what they were supposed to do. They obeyed. And when they're, after their two children were harmed, the person in this one case said, maybe I should stop vaccinating my kids because the results were almost instantaneous um, within a day or something of their, these vaccinations. And there's case after case after case. And so... If this is really going to move forward, and I hope it rests quietly on the table, which is where it belongs, um, it needs much more discussion. The, um, and furthermore, Madam Chair, you are a, a proponent, if there ever was one, for access to child care. And so to deprive people of chances who have made a legitimate, solid choice to not comply with the the rules of the Department of Health and this particular bill is, in my mind, just not even right. So I could go a lot longer, but I'm not. But there's, it, it just seems like nobody reads the stuff. If you think this is a great idea, read the data. Read the data. It's not like some kind of secret society data. It's the vaccine inserts. It's, it's all that. And I'm, I'm not anti-vax. I am pro-informed consent. 
And I am pro-collaboration with your doctors. I am pro-informed doctors. I'm pro-informed patients. And this uh, bill would deprive them of that. So I urge people to vote no. Thank you. Um, other, mem other member, Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I won't hopefully repeat anything that's been said already, but uh, this does go back to parental rights. We've heard a lot of different uh, testimony about we're all different. And the vac there's a lot of good vaccines out there that have helped society over the years, but parents have to retain that right if their children are going to have an adverse effect or the it should start with the parents understanding what's even being put into their children's bodies and th that needs to be held back I mean those rights have to be given back to the parents um, it, it was mentioned earlier about turning it over to government and, and trusting them well we know what the last three years or three and a half years with government and uh, vaccines has brought about. Um, it's filled up our email inboxes incredibly over the last week here because of this. Uh, people do not trust um, the system. And actually that's bad because there may be some that we're holding back on vaccines that shouldn't. And this isn't gonna help at all when you mandate it um, I like the topic uh, business freedom and choice. I think uh, a lot of us believe in that. Um, last year, we saw safe and sick time and paid family medical leave get pushed down their throats. So I don't think that was business freedom and choice. So we can't have it both ways. Um, and so I would ask you to vote in favor of the amendment, but uh, let's put this bill in the back corner of a um, drawer someplace and uh, let the time pass because it's uh, it's not a good bill in my opinion. Thank you. Um, any other member comments before we vote on the amendment? I'm sorry. Oh, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, and just to respond to Senator Bolden's um, <coughs> position on, on whether I would be allowed into a day, daycare facility or not based on uh, you know lack of medical exemption and still trying to follow a conscientious objection, sure, I would be allowed into certain facilities. Uh, the problem is there's no guarantee that the facility that I was attending when I was a child would not have installed a new rule, at which point, where am I gonna go? Um, as we've heard testimony multiple times, it's not easy to get into a child care facility. It's not like there's space available. We've already heard that discussion regularly before. So, okay, now my facility kicks me out because I don't meet the requirements that they've decided to set forth. What's your answer for that? Do you have an answer once this is installed for the parents that are now suffering the idea of finding a new child care facility that meets their needs? Um, and, and so with that, that's why I support the A2 amendment. Thank you. Senator Bolden, did you want to provide any more? I think we're, we can go ahead and vote, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, the uh, assistant will take the roll. Chair Wicklund? No. Vice Chair Mann? No. Lee Duckkey? Aye. Senator Abler? Yes. Senator Bolden? No. Um, Senator Hoffman? Senator Kupek? No. Senator Morrison? No. Senator Liskey? Yes. With, uh, with three ayes and five noes, the amendment is not adopted. The motion does not prevail. Any other member comments before we um, set the, lay the bill over? Senator Bolden, any final comments? I, just if I could, I, I'll be brief, Madam yeah. Chair. Um, I we uh, veered far uh, far away from the focus of the bill in some of the testimony, so I just want to sort of bring us back. Uh, this bill is not about forcing parents to do anything. This is not a mandate. This is not about COVID. This is not about the flu. It is certainly not about abortion. It is not even about increasing vaccine rates. Um, and if you are for business freedom, then this is the bill for you. This really is around. Um, allowing private 
businesses to make choices about the risks in their facilities. Um, and I would also just note that, you know, this has the support of many providers and many child care centers. We, uh, you know, did not hear from a lot of them because they are busy working. <laughs> they are doing the work right now. I suspect that's why uh, uh, Nicole Flick maybe, you know, had to come back and, and join us later. And so um, this really is about uh, the safety of kids and, and the risks for private businesses um, and allowing them to make choices um, about their businesses. And so um, I would encourage committee member support. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, members, for the discussion today. And uh, this bill will be laid over for future consideration. Um, seeing no other business before the committee, that we are adjourned.